Jane, and I want to preface this video with a little more information that I researched on Sylvia Plath before I give you the review that I made, having not done the research yet on the author. The author of The Bell Jar's name is Sylvia Plath. She's born on October 27th, and she died on February 11th. She was 30 when she died. She killed herself in 1963. She was a Scorpio. That makes a lot of sense. The Bell Jar was a semi-autographical novel published shortly before her death in 1963. I did not realize that. I thought that it was a fictional character, Esther Greenwood, which is why I was so critical of her. I thought that it was a fictional character. But she had an abusive husband who received her estate and burned her last journal, saying that he did not want her children to have read it. So this woman was a highly abused woman and she ended up killing herself. And then her husband's future wife ended up killing herself and their four-year-old daughter. So this man, Mr. Hughes, was super messed up. Um, her gravestone apparently has been repeatedly vandalized because it says Hughes on it and the people that are fans of hers go and chisel off the name Hughes so it just says Sylvia Plath. And every time that that happens, because it happens often, every time her husband, her ex-husband, would remove her gravestone entirely, leaving her grave unmarked for like months at a time. So people are just, it, it's a sad story knowing that she can't rest. Poor Sylvia Plath is not resting in peace because People keep messing with her grave and her ex-husband received all the money from her estate and burned her last journals. Ah, oh, what a sad, horrible fate. I do wanna say that the reason why her work is so well-loved is because it exhibits a certain type of imagery and a certain style of writing that really is fantastically masterful. Um, although the subject matter when I was doing my review is that the subject, I didn't understand the character, I was looking at a bit more as a story and not for the artfulness of it. Um, for that aspect, I do understand why she is such an inspiration for people like Lana Del Rey, mentioning things like, um, talking about things like upper-class luxury lifestyle in conjunction with fetuses, blood, the moon, and skulls. So it's a very juxtaposed, unique style of writing that inspired many other people, and she ended up winning the Pulitzer Prize posthumously, which means after she was dead. And she's one of four people, she's like the fourth person to receive that award, that honor, after her death. So that being said, keep in mind that I didn't know any of this when I made the review that you're about to see. So thank you for being kind to me in my naivete when I made that review purely on my opinion of the story. Uh, Time and Life both reviewed uh, a work of hers called Ariel in the wake of her death. And her poetry and all her work was a, a charting of Plath's increasing desperation or a death wish. Um, here was a woman superbly talented in her craft, whose final poems uncompromisingly charted female rage, ambivalence, and grief in a voice which many women identified. And that I can absolutely attest to because reading that book, there were many sentiments and statements that she said where I was like, I've absolutely been there. I wouldn't be brave enough to put it on paper, but here it is. So all of that being said, and I hope you enjoy my review. Hola. I'm Juana de la Selva, and today I want to talk to you about this book that I just read called The Bell Jar. Have you heard of it? <laughs> it's a classic by Sylvia Plath, and this is one of Lana Del Rey's favorite books as well. It very much influenced her writing style, and I can tell. I wanted to read this book because it is referred to so often, just like Lolita, people talk about it so much, that I wanted to know what they were talking about. And having had personal struggles with mental health, um, I always found people referring to this book. I see why it's a classic because it is really descriptive and um, does a really good job of getting you inside the mind of someone who is unwell and what exactly it's like to have the perspective of this just completely negatively focused mind. I didn't really like this book. I mean, I knew I wouldn't love it because it's not like a bright topic, but I didn't I didn't resonate with the character at all, Esther Greenwood. She was very self-focused. She felt no remorse for how she was making other people suffer in her life. And I really don't relate to that. Um, I feel like the hardest part of mental health struggles is the fact that you're dragging other people down. So the fact that she wanted to drag other people down with her intentionally so that she would, so everyone else could feel her pain, I feel like that was so selfish and awful. Also, she just kept treating people really badly that were close to her, that were trying to be nice to her. She would make up stories and put on airs all the time to pretend that she was things that she wasn't because her self-esteem was so awful. She just lies to everyone to make people think 
whatever she wants them to think about her and she feels no remorse for that which i don't identify with whatsoever you could tell that she was suicidal because she made a few decisions where i was just like why are you doing that i didn't understand and she was very attention seeking like when she she got into a fight with a man so basically the story is about a girl who goes to new york because she won a trip i'll just read to you a few notes summer in new york a young woman, underprivileged, receives a prize trip from a fashion magazine to New York, including jobs in New York for a month for 12 winners. So there's 12 girls, they all get these huge prizes, like expenses paid, ballet tickets, passes to fashion shows. There's like something for all 12 of these winners to do every day. So it's like a huge prize to win. It's such a, an honor. And um, she is excited by that, but not really. Like she's grateful, but she's also not that outwardly grateful. She just seems sort of down all the time, which, which I understand because when you have depression, it's hard to feel excited about things that you should feel excited about. So I don't fault her for that. But um, she's a very jealous person. She doesn't feel like she belongs. So she makes friends with, or this girl kind of latches onto her, named Doreen. And Doreen is sort of bossy and takes over her social life and starts telling her who to hang out with and who not to. And um, she's really uh, rebellious and not doing the things that the trip had set out for them. So like they, she wasn't going on the, the ballet and the fashion shows and stuff that they were like given free tickets to as a prize. She chose to like go on the street and hang out with guys at the bar instead, which I was like, if you have a month of this fantastic opportunity and you're gonna waste it going to the bar with this trashy girl who wants to waste her opportunity and make fun of all the other girls, that's super lame. So I wasn't into that. When she ends up meeting a man at the bar who's like being violent and rude to her and then she like accepts a bunch of drinks from him. And I was like, why are you doing that? But you know, she's young I'm trying to, and she has low self-esteem. So I'm trying to like have compassion for her and why she would make that choice. Maybe she just liked having attention from him even though he was completely rude to her. And I don't understand at all why she wanted attention from him. I don't understand why she even interacted with him, but she continued to like drink with him. And then when they got into a little fight, she had said something that like insulted him on accident because he's that kind of person. And then they got into a fight and she ended up having to like gouge her high heel into his calf and stuff. It was like a really violent little fight. So then she had blood gashed on her cheek and she chose to leave it there when she was on the bus. And that was when I was like, okay, you're just like, if you're not gonna help yourself and if you're not gonna like, accept help from people who are trying to care about you, then why are you going out of your way to make yourself show that you're suffering? People are already trying to help you. You're just trying to make it worse and not appreciate the people that are trying to help you. I don't get it. So then after that happened, she went up to the top of the parapet and in this beautiful like visual scene, she gets all of her clothing and, and lets it fly out of the window, out of the top of the parapet while she's still like all blood torn from like her fight with the violent guy she shouldn't have been hanging out with at the bar that she shouldn't have been at because she should have been at the fashion show that she was given tickets to because she won this fantastic prize. So weird decisions, but I do understand because toward the end, she basically expresses how she is self-sabotaging and that I do understand. So it's, it is like a journey with someone to see them making all these choices that's like ruining their opportunities and it's so sad to watch you're like why didn't you take that opportunity so she flies all of her clothing out of the window after she does so the next day she has to put clothes on and she doesn't have any so she has to borrow clothing from a friend of hers in the group the other 12 girls but she has to trade her favorite bathrobe that she wears all the time for this funky outfit so that she can have clothes to wear the next day. And I was like, girl, I don't really, we wouldn't be friends. I wouldn't hang out with her. She started trying to kill herself after she had a few embarrassing experiences with men. She went on a date with this man who her ex-boyfriend's mom hooked her up with. And he seemed really um, promising. He was handsome in his own way, light brown hair, much too short, so she's judgmental. Dark blue eyes, lively, challenging expression, tan, good teeth, intuition, plays tennis, drives a fun old green convertible. So he seemed really promising. They went on on a date and within a few minutes of her being on her date, this other woman that was part of their group, she was another simultaneous interpreter and so was her date. So Esther's date 
and this other simultaneous interpreter end up hitting it off like 10 minutes into their date and they end up walking down the beach together and she just gets left on her date. I felt really bad for her in that instance. And then after that happened, she just started feeling so bad. She started having these like downward spiral of thinking where she was like, I can't cook, I'm a terrible dancer, I can't sing, I have no balance. I don't know shorthand. Everybody always said I should know shorthand. I've always wanted to ride horses and ski, but I can't because they're too expensive. And so she just felt like she wasn't worth anything. And so she started feeling like she just wants to die. So she started losing it at her mom's house. She stopped washing her clothes and she said this funny thing where she's like, the sweaty cotton gave off a sour but friendly smell. And I was like, I doubt you smelled friendly at that point. <laughs> So she's a weird one. I, I did not relate to her. The moment that she threw her clothes out of the window, I was like, bitch, <laughs> you're not, I have no sympathy for you. <laughs> I don't understand what you're doing. I just, like, she didn't get, think about getting dressed the next day, but at the same time, she was so idle. She was like, I don't need clothes. I'm not going to need clothes where I'm going. So I do understand that thought process. So she ends up trying to drown herself in the ocean while she's on like a double date. And she's like, come on, come with me to swim out to this rock. And this guy's like, no, dude, that looks dangerous. And so she like tries to get out there and then she, she like reluctantly survives. She tried to push herself down and swim under the waves, but that her body floated up anyway and that she like buoyantly got back to the shore easily. And she was frustrated that she didn't die. And then um, she tried to hang herself, but she didn't have anything to hang the thing on that would be like sturdy enough. And then she went and visited her dad's grave. And I could tell that she's very much grieving her dad's death. She doesn't want to admit it, but she very much is. She just doesn't go along with her mom and her mom is trying so hard to help her and she doesn't appreciate her mom's help. She does not empathize with her mom at all and I, I can't empathize with her for that. Um, she ends up taking a whole bottle of strong pills and she crawled into a dark hole in the cellar and she like pulled these like pieces of wood over her head so she could cover herself in this hole. And then when she came to inside of the hole, she like hit her head and then passed out again. So she ended up being missing for like two days. And then when they finally found her, they had to pull her out of this hole. And it turns out one of those like things she put above her head had fallen on her head. So she was, she got fucked up in that hole. And then um, she ended up going to therapy, obviously. They started taking her to all these doctors because they were like, you don't need a normal doctor. You need a, you need a psychiatrist. So they started taking her to these electroshock therapy people. So she did an electroshock th therapy and that she said it was terrifying and that she like felt her whole body with the jolt. And that was when the title of the story came in. She had said that she, there's a quote from the book about her, the bell jar quote, let me find that for you. If Mrs. Guinea had given me a trip to Europe or a round the world cruise, it wouldn't have made one scrap of difference to me because wherever I sat on the deck of a ship or at the street cafe in Paris or Bangkok, I would be sitting under the same glass bell jar, stewing in my own sour air. So that's what it's about. It's about being in, no matter where you go, there you are, one of my best friends likes to say. That's what it's about, how when you are in this mental illness, you are trapped in the sourness of your own stench. <laughs> so this is a heavy book. It honestly made me feel better about myself, which is really strange to say, but sometimes I worry that I'm like slightly that I'm like losing it <laughs> or I don't know. I've had struggles with intense emotions and mental health stuff. And there's been times when I've been like, am I crazy? And reading this book now, I know I'm not crazy. I do relate to some of the things she's talking about. And I see now how that can continue into a very negative spiral trajectory that I don't want to go down. I'm, this is not me. And that's what I realized. And that's what I'm grateful for. I read this very quickly in like two days. It's very dark. And some of it was like, so she likes to, Play with blood a lot and I didn't appreciate that. I don't relate to that. Um, but I do see in, in the song Hope is a Dangerous Thing for a Woman Like Me to Have by Lana Del Rey. She talks about that's why actually I read this book is because of that song because she's like um, I was tearing up town in my effing nightgown 24-7 Sylvia Plath writing in blood on the walls because the ink in my pen don't work in my notepad and that's I was like 24 seven Sylvia Plath, what's she talking about? And so I wanted to know, so now I know. Now I know that Lana Del Rey is really weird <laughs> and dark, just like me, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not, I'm not as dark as this book. So I'm glad I read it, but I don't relate to Esther Greenwood. Have you read this book? Why do you feel like people love it so much? I feel like I appreciate 
the illustration that it does to let you inside the mind of someone who is mentally unwell. And also, I do like the premise of them being on that trip in New York. It's pretty cool. Um, but it's like so cringy to read this book because I'm like, oh, why'd you do that? Oh, why'd you do that? I'm like, oh, I wouldn't have done that. Why are you doing that? Like <laughs> the whole time I'm like just confused as to what her motivations are. But, um, and in the end, she ends up just going back to electroshock therapy, even though she didn't want to so badly. It scared her so bad. And um, there was one really powerful part of the book that I really appreciated. So she had a boyfriend who was in medical school and she thought she was better than him and she was always like making fun of him and being rude to him and lying to him and just being terrible. And then she would like, she would judge him and condemn him and she was just not cool. So um, he ended up having another friend of his that was this cool girl that he would hang out with sometimes. So naturally, Esther hated the cool girl that he would hang out with because she was cool. He liked her personality. And so she was like, fuck that girl. So she, she didn't like that friend. Well, that friend, Joan, ended up coming to the same insane asylum that she was in. And they ended, ended up becoming friends. And Esther was a virgin for this whole book until she finally, she wanted to lose her virginity, but she didn't know how to do it. So she ended up meeting this man who was like um, debonair and like attractive to her. So he, she told him she was a virgin and he was like, okay, I'll help you lose your virginity. So they... They did it, but she bled a lot. And like, he, she left his house and she didn't tell him that she was like bleeding, which I was like, let him help you. But she just makes weird decisions. She makes all the opposite decisions that I would make. So she's bleeding, you know, after they had sex and she's like continuing to bleed, she's like hemorrhaging. So she leaves his house and pretends she's fine. She bleeds on his car seat. And then she goes to her house, back to the asylum, and she's like, I need to go to the hospital. So she like passes out. She ends up back in the, she ends up in the hospital and Joan is there with her and Joan is holding her hand while she's dealing with this bleeding. And she was so scared, but Joan was there and it was like a powerful moment. Let me read that part to you. She finally loses her virginity to an enticing, intelligent man. She ends up bleeding a lot and has to go to the hospital. Her new best friend, Joan, her ex's other love interest, they were annoyed with one another and then became close in the insane asylum together is there for her in the hospital when she almost, she is almost dying in the hospital from her vajay. <laughs> that was my notes. The next day, Esther awakens in the hospital to discover Joan, bestie, holding her hand last night while being probed vaginally and bleeding profusely because they were doing like, they were seeing if she's okay. And, um, and then and she came to in the hospital and she's like, where's Joan? And Joan had committed suicide. She had hung herself. So then Esther is heartbroken because her best, best friend just killed herself and now she has to go back to electroshock therapy. And that's the end of the book. I was like, well, wow, disturbing, hallucinogenic, dark, bloody, scary that people can take control of your life when you start showing certain signs in this time period. This was a while back, but still, if you become, if somebody thinks if you do the wrong thing, people can start to think that you're going crazy and then you can get taken away like she did. It's really scary. It really puts some perspective in my mind about when I get into my dark places, like I don't wanna keep going down that road. I need to really make sure that I don't play in that area because I can see now the trajectory that you can go down and it's very dark and I don't belong there. <laughs> so have you read The Bell Jar? Let me know what you think in the comments. Um, thank you for being here. I appreciate you being kind in the comments. I'm a sensitive person. Um, thank you so much for supporting my channel. Please subscribe and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Happy reading. Have a wonderful day. This has nothing to do with anything, but look, that's a bobcat. I saw a bobcat. We made eye contact.